So there's a lot of dumb stuff happening in the technology space right now, just all over. Uh, companies are constantly doing things where you see that and you think, that, that was not smart. That was not something they should have done. But you know what is smart? Hiring with ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter is the most powerful technology to find people with the right experience for your job and actively invite them to apply, to actually go out and find the people who should be coming into your job. When you're trying to hire by just having them find you, you miss a huge amount of the potential applicant pool. But ZipRecruiter, by going everywhere, by having all this underlying technology, it actually goes to them. And that's the kind of thing, that's the kind of matching you need to get the people you need. It's why ZipRecruiter is rated number one by employers in the US. It's based on Trustpilot rating of hiring sites with over a thousand reviews. So a lot of people use this, a lot of people love it. It's gotten a lot of great people into great jobs. And you should try it too. Right now, my listeners can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash EZRA. Again, that is ZipRecruiter.com slash EZRA. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. After these major crashes and failures in the press system, you don't see the press sort of called into crisis. You don't see the equivalent of a 9-11 commission to examine what went wrong. You don't see collective action within the institution You just go on to the next story because everybody was wrong, so it's not really a problem. Hello, welcome to the Ezra Klein Show on the Vox Media Podcast Network. Before we begin, quick announcement. We're looking for an executive producer of audio for Vox's podcast. This is a a senior job. It'll be driving the editorial direction of our whole podcast operation. In that role, one of the big pieces will be working with me on this show. I would love someone who knows this show, has ideas about where it could go, what it could become, who should be on it. You can find the job listing by going to voxmedia.com slash careers. Again, that is voxmedia.com slash careers. Scroll all the way down to studio job listings and you will see the job. Again, that is voxmedia.com slash careers. Okay, today's episode is tricky. There's a a small class of episodes where I'm a little nervous about releasing them into the world, and this is one of them. Uh, I'm talking to Jay Rosen, who is one of the smartest thinkers and critics of the media out there, writes Press Think, he's at New York University, he's a really brilliant guy. This is a conversation about something I am really agonizing over, which is, is the media, and I am part of the media, is the media hurting America? Are we making things worse rather than better? Am I? Everything I say in this podcast is going to make people mad. So I want to clarify where I'm coming from. I am not outside this machine looking in and criticizing it. I am inside this machine looking out. I am part of it. I am wondering how everything has gone so wrong. I'm trying to think through what is happening when I see so much good work being done around me and the outcome of it is nevertheless so toxic. If there's a problem here, I'm part of it. If what I say sounds critical, it's critical of me. I've done almost everything we're talking about here. This is a a space that I'm trying to work through, that I'm trying to figure out. A lot of these ideas are provisional. I'm working through them. I hope you will hear them that way. Hope you'll join me and Jay in trying to think through this. Look, there's a lot wrong in our political system right now. And I don't think the solutions are easy, but it starts with, I think, having some very real conversations about the problems. This is one of those conversations. Jay Rosen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Ezra. Let me ask you the question this way. How would we know if the political news media were doing a good job? What what would be the metrics we'd be looking for? Well, I think one of the most important would be uh, when the political press has uncomfortable truths to tell people there is the space and the trust to do that. Uh, That would be uh, one measure. Another would be whether the daily, weekly, monthly news agenda includes the things that really matter and that are really important for the future of our country. That would be a second one. And a third one for me would be a kind of diversity and in the sense that I think political journalism became far too monocultural and fixated on the same – Stories, uh, and even though journalists pride themselves on competition, they have a very peculiar meaning of competition. Competition to them means everyone does the same thing, and I beat you by five minutes. And if we had a more competitive political press, we would see different approaches. Each news room taking a different approach to how to report the nation. So those would be a couple of signs that I would look for. 
I, I think your point on competition there is super interesting. I'm worried that that's not what competition in a lot of spaces actually does. The, the competition can be this thing that drives towards homogeneity. Yeah. There was this article going around um, <laughs> journalism Twitter today, and it was a, a study asking the question, are journalists too focused on Twitter? Which I think we clearly, clearly are. But but Didn't one of, read that one. <laughs> but one of the I mean, one of the basic things is that Twitter is a space where you can see what all of your competitors are doing. Right. And and in a world when the competition is scary, when the business models are breaking a little bit, doing the things that are safe becomes a whole lot easier because the consequences of doing things that are unsafe, really taking a different look or approach, become pretty scary. Yeah, that's a very important point. The culture of the political press orients individual practitioners toward their professional peers rather than towards the users or even towards the shifting news scene in this sense. It's hard to know if you're doing well in journalism. How do you know that you're doing the right thing? And several ways that we could measure that, like audience response or your people like what you're doing are actually discredited by most journalists. Those are considered to be pandering. Uh, So market tests are a kind of pandering. And for various reasons, including that one, professional journalists are, are really oriented towards each other. Consider, for example, how powerful the prize culture is in journalism. And I think the fear of being out of the loop, the tendency of editors to say, why didn't we have this? Or even more bizarre statement that a lot of reporters hear, can we match this? Which is, an, is another way of saying, can we do the same story but put our name on it? All of those things, I think, are hugely powerful factors in the professional culture of journalism. That's one of the things that I am really afraid of. And, and I want to be pretty upfront about this conversation. I'm in a bit of a moment of agony around journalism. So mm-hmm. one of the reasons I invited you here is because I want to talk to smart people about it a little bit more. I can't shake the feeling that we're making things worse, not better. Like, And that mm-hmm. really hurts. And not because the individual work is bad. I think that journals are doing incredible work and in many cases better work than ever before. And certainly an individual news consumer has access to more great work than they've ever had in history. And yet the system we're part of, the incentives we're following, the way it all gets filtered, and also notably the way it gets read, right? Mm -hmm. Who is reading what and why, I think is creating a kind of overall system that is taking inputs that are often good and turning them into a a total output that that is problematic. And that that point you make about being very other-focused in journalism, I think about this in my own work, the way I feel the pressure – really pressure, right? Like a a kind of pain if I'm not on the thing everybody is talking about today, Mm -hmm. right? If Donald Trump gave some really nuts rally, right, where he said a bunch of stuff that was really off the wall, my feeling that I should, that Vox should, that that we should all be on it. And we Mm -hmm. should, because people expect us to, right? We're, We're explaining the news. And then at the same time, there are all these other stories happening in the world, all these upstream questions, you know, like say writing about the state of American journalism. And if I don't do that and nobody else is doing that, it doesn't yell at me the same way. It doesn't make me feel like I'm behind or I'm missing the story or I'm going right. to fall behind all my peers. Like there's no – nobody telling me to write the thing nobody else is writing. And that that, that imbalance between the peer pressure, like the, the feeling that you're falling behind everybody if you're not doing the thing and all the things that need to be written about or seen or thought through that do not have enough voice to scream at you. Mm -hmm. seems like a real distortion and a damaging distortion in our work. Yeah. Another way to think about that would be there's always a risk that if you follow the story of the day, you are missing what's actually happening. And you could look at this pack journalism phenomena as a way of spreading that risk. Because if everyone is wrong, no one is wrong. So if everyone is following the wrong pattern – It's not a problem for any individual uh, professional because everyone missed the same story. So that's one of the reasons why after these major crashes and failures in the press system like the run-up to the Iraq war, like the failure to alert the nation about the financial crisis, like the debacle of 2016 – 
you don't see the press sort of called into crisis. You don't see the equivalent of a 9-11 commission to examine what went wrong. You don't see collective action within the institution. You just go on to the next story because everybody was wrong, so it's not really a problem. Let me try to take the other side of that. I, I think I agree with it halfway, which is I do think there's been a lot of reckoning in the press post-Donald Trump. I think there's been these sort of slightly peculiar but nevertheless somewhat agonizing arguments over whether or not to call things he says that are untrue lies or are they just misinformation or, you know, a provably false fact or whatever, whatever you yeah, might say. Yeah, that's true. And there's certainly been a move into a more oppositional space. Yeah. And to a degree that's really surprised me, actually, the, the degree to which established journalistic institutions frame themselves more antagonistically to this president than they have to other presidents, I think is a real thing. I think it's a thing caused by him and his behavior to a large extent, but I think it's a real thing. The thing that I wonder about is that you've talked a lot about the view from nowhere, this idea that journalists often try to come at their work as if they don't have any view at all. Mm -hmm. And what I think has happened is that we've developed like the view from journalism, mm. the thing that we are willing to protect are, are some of the core ideas of journalism, truthfulness, facts, yeah. um, the idea that we are not the enemy of the people, which is different than actually being self-critical of ourselves. We've become very critical of Trump, but I'm not sure that we have really thought through our side of this, where he's sort of been able to mobilize us into protection of ourselves and the things we believe we stand for. Mm -hmm. But that's almost, I do think, and this is why I, I always say I half disagree with that point. I think he's delayed a reckoning inside of us. Well, I have several thoughts on that. One is, it's taken me a long time to understand this as a student of the American press. And I think most people in journalism would probably deny it or say that I'm wrong. But I I think I'm right. Most people in the political press long ago decided that there is no such thing as ideological innovation in journalism. What I mean by that is they think the major questions are settled. You don't take sides. You're not part of this party or that party. You find out what's going on in politics and you tell the truth no matter what. And what else do you need to know? And partisans try to move you this way or that way, and you have to ignore that. And it's almost like an end of history thing. Like there cannot be any better resolution than that. And you see this in the most widely quoted and eagerly accepted statement about some of these problems that anybody's made in American journalism, which is Marty Barron's we're not at war, we're at work, or – more recently, um, Greg Sulzberger, the publisher of the New York Times, said it in a different way, which is we're not going to be bullied into becoming the opposition and we're not going to be applauded into becoming the opposition. And there's good sense in both of those remarks. I think that Barron's statement in particular just captures the wisdom of the American press in sort of a completely clear and concise way. But there's a problem when an administration comes to power and a culture um, around that person rises in which the erosion of democratic institutions, not just the press but all of them, is part of how the political movement he leads is powered. What I mean by ideological innovation is I don't think our journalists have learned how to angle their work so that they can defend democratic institutions. And they probably need to at this point because it's getting really bad. Oh, so I I, I want to go much further on this. God, everything I say in this podcast is going to get me in trouble. You had this line in there, how he's powered. And the two things I was thinking about while you were talking there was one, one thing you're saying is the Barron quote, the Sulzberger quote, was it? Mm -hmm. Those are about how journalists relate to Donald Trump. Right? Do we become the opposition to right, him? That's the question. So we, we I, I, I we think that's, become the opposition. I think it's the wrong question. One question is how did we give rise to Donald Trump? And yeah. far from how do we defend American institutions, I think there's a real question about how do we stop making them worse. I think it's a very self-flattering space right now that we are the people defending American institutions. And by the way, of course it's true for some of us, right? One thing you always get into when you get into any criticism of journalism is that 
like people immediately point to like the investigative reporters. And like God bless the investigative reporters. Right. But that is not what all everybody's doing. No, right. That's not what that's not what most of what is happening on cable news yeah. is say. And so here's a way I've been thinking about this problem. And, and here's why I'm worried we are part of a much bigger system than us, by the way, that is leading to a, a real degradation of American institutions. I think of this like as like the Donald Trump, like Michael Avenatti problem. And I think that what is being seen, what is being exposed is that journalism has a definition of newsworthiness that we always kind of say means important, but it doesn't really mean important. It is some mixture of mm -hmm. important, new, outrageous, conflict-oriented, secret. Like there's a lot of things happening in it. But one of the ways you can hack it is if you just go outrageous enough. Yeah, um, sure. If you just like – like what Donald Trump understood is if you just like do the craziest thing, the thing that nobody's ever seen before, you will always get all the oxygen in the room. Mm -hmm. And then I think in certain ways – and I don't want to compare him to Trump in his ethics or morals. I think he's, he's doing something different. But I think Michael Avenatti has recognized that there's a way of hacking the system too. It's a kind of like – it's a very loud – talking about like getting into a fight with Donald Trump Jr. in an MMA cage match. I mean, there's something happening there that is unusual where this guy has had a very, very fast rise, you know, also for legal work, but but also as a media personality, very separate from the legal work he's doing, such that he's now being polled in 2020 races. And the thing I think about, the, the way in which journalism, I think, is an actor in here that we don't want to admit, is I think about Amy Klobuchar. Amy Klobuchar, the senator from Minnesota, is arguably the most popular politician in the country. Um, if you run one of these like looks and think, look at who is the most popular given where their state is on like the red-blue measure, mm -hmm. Klobuchar is probably the most popular politician in the country correcting for state bias. That's a remarkable thing. And part of the reason is that she speaks in a way that like a lot of people can hear her. I mean, even in the Brett Kavanaugh hearings, he began by saying, hey, look – I may hate all these other Democrats, but but Senator Klobuchar, I like you. And then he got in trouble by, yeah. by attacking her because he can't and he do that. Yeah. And he apologized. But how does she get coverage? Why, mm. why does she not get more coverage? Why does arguably the most popular member of the U.S. Senate not get more day-to-day -day coverage than Michael Avenatti? Yeah. And like that is the way I think we are probably making things worse. We are making decisions about who to amplify – and being led into decisions about who to amplify by algorithms and the public. I mean, there's all kinds of things working in the system that I don't think we even fully understand. But overall, like the voices that are winning out in that are not, I don't think, the best voices for the system. And they're also not the most, at least when they start, the most important voices. We can then make them the most important voices. And then, of course, we have to cover them. Yeah. But they're not, when they start, the most important voices. And like, that's a thing I don't, I don't, I actually don't know how to solve it, um, but I don't think we're reckoning with it well. Yeah, I agree with all of that, but let me, let me go back to the beginning of, of that observation. Journalism academics have always known, and we've talked about this a lot, that newsworthiness, as the American press defines it, isn't a system with any coherence to it. It doesn't make any sense. It's just a list of factors that occasionally come together to produce news, and there's no real logic to it other than – it's a list of things that can make something news and it's not a system. It's not thought through. You can't reform it. It doesn't have any ideas behind it. And the advantage of it is that it leaves maximum leeway for editors to say this is news and that's not news. And so it's news if journalists decide it's news. And one of the things that slips in there, of course, and I know you've written about this, is that entertainment logic can actually be the logic that a news company is operating under. And it doesn't have to explain that to its users or even to itself. So an example I would use is the way that CNN has purchased these pro-Trump talking heads to people its panels with doesn't have any editorial logic to it. That it is, It makes sense to have conservative voices. It makes sense to have um, people from the middle of the country. It makes sense to have – people who have certain priorities, it doesn't make editorial sense to have a pundit who's defending Trump right or wrong. But it does make sense to have people like that on the air. Avenatti would be an example. If you are following entertainment logic, if the uh, news show is more like a sitcom where you need predictable characters who can generate endless plots and you can slot them into which role they are playing because you always know what they're going to say. 
And I think entertainment logic has become a huge part of what the new system, especially the cable news system, does, but it's described as, as news. The other point that I would make in response to what you said, most of which I agree with, is that when I said there wasn't a reckoning after these big fall downs, I mean about fundamental things like this. We don't really have a press corps that takes responsibility for the priority list that it ends up working from. We have journalists who are just reacting to events. And when you have a political figure who is beyond embarrassment, who is deliberately polarizing, who has no sense of shame, and as you've written, doesn't care about negative coverage and negative publicity, that does hack the system. And I don't think our journalists have figured out a way to respond to that. There are two things in there I want to pick up on. One is this idea of taking responsibility for the priority list and the other is entertainment logic. And I want to try to connect them. Let me start with entertainment logic. I think another way of saying that term, which is in some ways honestly clearer, is market logic. Journalism mm-hmm. is a very competitive market. And I also just think it's constantly should be understood, and, and it isn't, that just the context of American journalism right now, which is different than it in the 90s, is it's a very difficult business. And yeah. all of us who've now been in it for you know the last decade or two have been through layoffs, and we've seen great institutions fall. And this is not like when journalism was safe as a business and you could like do whatever. Like the threat of everything collapsing around you is always there. And that's a place where – you get very, very tight to the market, right? You're very much trying to read the market. You're very much trying to survive. Mm -hmm. Um, And people don't want – this is a great line from George Saunders, the the brain-dead megaphone many years ago where he says, tell me the truth and tell me as much truth as you can while making a profit are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you're – like I get the press releases from CNN and MSNBC and Fox News talking about how they're outrating the other. Like yeah. all the – they're always sending these press releases out. Right. Like they're really trying to win, right? They're, like there's a market logic here. I think when we talk about entertainment, it sounds trivial. Um, like people are just making a decision to be entertaining rather than substantive. But rightly or wrongly, I think like what's really happening is they're trying to be competitive, mm-hmm. right? They're trying to, to, to have enough money to fund the journalism they care about most I think is the, the more generous way to put it. And I think that then gets into this taking responsibility issue. I really agree that we don't, as an industry, take responsibility for what we're covering. And I sort of think there are two reasons for that. One is that if we were to do so, then we sort of have to say why we're covering what we're covering. And that would open us up to the idea that we're not a mirror, we're an actor or an amplifier. Like we are are a core actor in in everything we cover. Like we change it just by covering it. Right. And we don't want to – like that's the scariest thing. No, that's death. Like yeah, that's death, right? Which – and yet it's obviously true. Mm-hmm. That's the weirdest thing about journalism. <laughs> Look, I've been writing about this I for know. 15 years. That's so why I wanted I, you on I'm the with podcast. You on that one. Like, yeah. like, and I want to talk about that. But, but the other thing that's not just that part, right? That's like the sort of guild issue. But the other thing that's hard to take responsibility for is that we see ourselves as a public trust and, a, and an actor on behalf of the public, and we're also a business. Mm-hmm. And like in any market, no matter what you're doing, if you're really in the market, like it's incentives seep around you. Yeah. There are places that are fully separate from the market, say a ProPublica, but for a lot of us, it's not. And I think particularly in this era when things are so competitive and everybody's competing so hard over, you know, with Facebook and Google, a declining advertising market, like we don't know how to take responsibility for the fact that we somehow have to survive but also cover the right things. And like like how do you do that exactly? Well, this is one of the reasons that in response to my own sense of – frustration and despair about all of these problems that we're discussing. I'm working with the Dutch startup, The Correspondent, because it kind of starts the whole thing over. It tries to develop a business model membership in which people support journalists directly without the third party of advertising in the way, while at the same time redrawing the definition of news changing the incentives for individual journalists uh, and and kind of rebuilding the architecture of trust 
in journalism. And it's a tiny drop in the news system and it's most likely you know, not going to work to change that system. But it's the only thing I could think of doing because you're right that all these interlocking – failures are keeping the new system sort of in the same place despite the fact that everybody in it knows that it's not working. And I don't have an answer to that except to try and start over. And that's what I'm doing with this Dutch startup, which is moving to the United States. But, but I do wonder about – I often hear subscription offered as the answer for this. Mm. And to some degree, I think it can help. But I don't understand truly how those incentives are all that different. My just read of the subscription space, um, the modern subscription space, not the one we had when it was, you know, local monopolies. And also I should note there's like a professional subscription space where you're getting the Wall Street Journal or Politico Pro or something because you need right, that. Right, that's different. That's yeah. different. But a lot of what works in subscription is you've given people something they feel so identified with. Like it, it, it's so on their side, they're moved to support it. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you look at the biggest podcasts that get supported on Patreon, say, they're not like the most modest podcasts. They're very, very, very politically intense. Yeah. Um, and so I do think the incentives of, of subscription are a little bit different for sure. But I'm not sure they're as different as people think. You know, people are very wound up um, correctly. It's a very, very difficult time. And someone who is their port in a storm – you know, like in a way, and this is a weird thing to say, but Facebook and things like that have a, a little bit more of a subscription model than people realize. You actually do subscribe to things and then you keep getting them. I mean, you're not paying for them, right? So there's not money on the line. But what you choose to subscribe to matters there. And then what you choose to boost from that subscription, what you care enough about to support by like putting your identity behind it. And if you look at what's thriving there, I mean, through the Brett Kavanaugh thing, people kept putting up the most overperforming posts on Facebook. And it was just like Fox News, Fox News, Breitbart, Fox News, yep, Ben Shapiro, Breitbart, Fox News. And yep. <laughs> like, I don't know, that makes me skeptical that subscription models where people are supporting the things that they feel most strongly about and have the most identity connection to is going to look all that different. Uh, that's possible. Journalism news production has always been subsidized by something and the nature of the subsidy system changes over time. And each system for subsidizing journalism has flaws and weaknesses. And you identified the one in subscription. Membership is a little bit different. Membership is you, you do join the cause but you also want the work to spread beyond those who are subscribers and so it doesn't imply a paywall. So it's a little bit different in that sense. But it's not immune to the incentive that you that you correctly recognize there. Another way to think about this is that especially with Facebook and the internet taking over the new system and kind of swallowing it, we are much better now at sensing demand for Truth. So in a way, truth-telling has been reshaped by the demand side. So now everybody is aware when there is a demand for a story to be true. And Facebook responds to that, which is very different than is the story true. And I don't think we know how to deal with that distortion. So I'm, I'm as pessimistic as you are about that. Ah, work travel. Do you stay by the airport or in the city center? Do you do a client dinner or room service? Should you pack your swimsuit? Well, just ask yourself, what would the boss do? Yeah, well, the boss would choose Hilton. From modern meeting spaces to amazing pools, Hilton Hotels and Resorts has everything you need to get down to business. And a little pleasure. Check out Hilton Hotels and Resorts. Travel like the boss. Let me go back for another minute to the question of the market because something I've been thinking about a lot of like your um, perspective on. I've been thinking about the way journalism was a much more inefficient business, an inefficient market 20 or 30 years ago. When I mm. grew up, I grew up in Southern California. You could get the OC Register. My family got the LA Times, the Orange County edition of the LA Times. Right. You know, CNN was starting around the time that I, you know, was beginning to watch news, but it wasn't that old. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I don't want to be overly ironic about it, but, you know, you had some amount of talk radio, you had NPR. I mean, you just had less. There sure. was less. Lots um, less. Yeah. And 
one thing about that is that just from a market perspective, you really couldn't get what you wanted. I mean, I remember when, one of the things I think people miss about blogging, which is how I got into this, is actually how little political opinion there was available to people at that time. It's like there yeah. was like the op-ed section of your newspaper. Like, George was Will. <laughs> there was George Will. You got yeah. George Will and E.J. Dion. I was like, yeah. like, good luck. Yeah, one from um, each side. And so like this explosion of opinion, it, it really filled a need. And also just this explosion of everything, right? International news. I mean, my, my father's Brazilian, and I remember when he could start getting Brazilian papers online and, you know, read Le Monde and, and, and get more European news. Right? It was very different. Yeah. And it was remarkable. So on some level, like from the market perspective, like it got so much better. And then I think that, you know, I wonder if some of the inefficiencies in that market weren't good. Like just some of the space, um, like the space between – what everybody else was doing and what the audience wanted right that second, whether or not it was what they wanted overall, but what they wanted in that moment. Mm-hmm. Like there was space for for like a little bit more judgment and a little bit more calm. And that's kind of been given now like the bad word of gatekeepers. But Felix Salmon, um, uh, the, the financial writer, but who's also very, I think, thoughtful media critic, has often talked about slack in the system, like mm-hmm. that journalism yeah. needs a certain, amount, a certain amount of slack in the system to do its best work. Yeah. It can't be making widgets all the time. And I don't know, like, it's something I know some way to turn it back. But I do think that something that changed is it got so much more competitive. We became, like, from a capitalism perspective, so much better of a market. We became so much better at serving our audience. But, like, making a market too good isn't always a good thing, right? You destroy the planet. You pollute rivers, right? Like, overly competitive markets, right? You sell everybody chips. Like, overly competitive markets are not always the best thing. But I don't even know that we have a way of thinking about what it would mean to change that. Certainly, I don't know what it would mean to change that. But it seems to me like a big part of the issue. Yeah. I've been thinking a lot about this uh, lately because of sort of where we've ended up with those changes that began when blogging and then social media began. Um, So, for example, I've been thinking a lot lately about something that happened in 2004. You'll you'll remember this. During the Bush-Kerry race, these – gentlemen called the Swift Boat Veterans for Truth wanted to put into the new system the the story that not only did John Kerry not deserve his medals, but he actually behaved dishonorably in Vietnam. And this was a charge that political journalists looked at and evaluated, and they found that it didn't have anything to it. It wasn't a valid claim. Uh, And before that time... That would have been the end of it. If the press didn't talk about it, it wouldn't be an item in the campaign. And, of course, the Swift Boat Veterans for Truth in 2004 did become a factor in the campaign. And that story got into the system and into the political debate and influenced people anyway. And that was the moment where it became clear that this gatekeeping function, which does – arise because of what Felix said, that there's a certain amount of slack in the system. I think that's a very important insight he had. A lot of people, including me at times, celebrated that moment. The gatekeepers don't have the same power anymore. And I could understand the frustration of people who had to go through those gatekeepers. I was one of them in writing about the press. I It was like before blogging and after blogging for me. After blogging, I could address people without the say-so of the professional journalists that I was trying to write about. So I'm sympathetic to that. But now we can see that that comes with a lot of problems. Similarly, I used to write about this uh, fact about the internet, which is really important to understand, that it creates a a falling cost for like-minded people to locate each other, realize how many of them there are, find champions, and publish their own concerns to each other. And that's a great thing about the internet. So for today, if you discover you have a medical condition, you can easily find online people who share that condition, and you can find information that is very useful to you, and you can find people to talk to, and you can kind of organize yourselves in a way that allows you to do battle with the medical system and with what your doctor is telling you. So that's the falling cost for like-minded people to locate each other. But it has such a dark side, and I don't think I appreciated that as much as I should have. Something you just made me think about with Swift Boat Veterans. I've been reading a book that's coming out, um, I think in a month or two, by Matthew Pressman called On Press, Mm -hmm. which I very, very much recommend to people buy when it comes out. But 
It's funny because it, it's talking about the rise of, I guess, really explanatory reporting, although the way we do it now is much more interpretive than when it was done then. But but in this sort of 50s, 60s, 70s period, the changeover from journalism is really a kind of stenography where they're just reprinting speeches and press releases and things are very straight to more yeah. interpretive reporting. And – you know, he locates that story in one, a much more competitive business model where newspapers now feel they're competing with television and television mm-hmm. is so much more visual and vivid and entertaining and like how do you how do you survive in that? But also – this goes to your point about the Swift Boat veterans, McCarthy. Yeah, yeah McCarthy Joseph McCarthy was a, big, a big event in that history. Yeah. And and the Joseph McCarthy, you know, as, as people know, created this Red Scare, lied a lot, destroyed a lot of lives. But he was a powerful person doing something that was politically important. So journalists just dutifully wrote down what he was saying, yeah, and became part of something that that went really wrong. I mean, we now look at, like, it's amazing the way we narrativize things, right? What did the press do during McCarthy? It was Murrow. Right, like Murrow yeah. stopped him. <laughs> like, actually, what did we do during McCarthy? For most of it, we created him, we built him up, we helped him. Yeah, by reporting his charges, absolutely. And so there's this huge reckoning, and and I do wonder if we're not in a similar thing now. I I do think Trump looks and 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 Pressman talks about this. It looks in certain ways like a McCarthy-like figure, mm-hmm. and different in a lot of ways, of course, too. And we sort of like we clearly helped build him. He understood something about us that he could activate. Yeah. But like what, right? We became more interpretive. We became more explanatory, you know, even compared to where we were now just five or six years ago. And it doesn't look like it's making much better. One of the things that I've been thinking about in all this is that there's this question for me of like, what what does the media actually do? We tell people we report, which is obviously some of what we do. But we also like watch Super Bowl commercials and write them up and we like watch movies that you can see also and we write that. Like we do all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that what we do most fundamentally is we amplify. We Mm -hmm. choose some information to amplify and not others. Some of that information we have uncovered, some of it is public domain, some of it was handed to us in a press release. Like we get it all kinds of ways. But we amplify information. We're amplifiers. Yeah. And – We don't have – and this goes to your point about taking responsibility. We don't have any kind of public, transparent, I think, or even internal system for what we amplify because like that is a choice we don't feel we should make and it is nevertheless a choice we are making. And like in that space between a choice we shouldn't make, a choice we are making and it being the fundamental thing we do, like that space has come to me to be like the zone of the problem. Yeah. Well, this is why I've been writing about The View from Nowhere for so long is that it's a name for that problem. And you're right. A lot of what journalism does is it amplifies things. And there's nowhere you can go to look up what a given news organization is going to amplify for you. But you should. I wrote a piece uh, last year about transparency and trust in journalism. One of the recommendations I made in it was – that news organizations should go public with their priority list. And it should be not just public but live. Like I should be able to go to Vox.com and find a list of what your editorial priorities are going to be over the near term, the things that you're going to come back to. You're going to cover the news and you'll react to what happens, of course. But these are the things that we're going to come back to again and again because these are the things that we find are really fundamental. And what I mean by live is that it changes And it can shift and things can drop off that agenda and suddenly leap onto it. But it should be public and it should be there not just for the users to know what kind of news they're getting, but it should be there for the producers of the news, the journalists to know these are the things that we need to amplify because we believe they are extremely important. And we don't have a system like that. Well, actually, I'd like to hear you talk more about that because I've thought about this question and thought about what would something like that even look like? And how would you hold yourself to it? Because in some ways I could become very – I know you're talking about it being live. But if you're just creating them as just saying what you're covering at that moment, then it's almost tautological. Like is it at a principles level? Is it the stories you think are most important? How would it actually guide us? Like well, at, w- at what level of abstraction are you talking well, first of all, no one's done it yet, so we don't know how it works and it would have to be you know, debugged and revised and it would have to be an experimental effort. But the way I imagine it working is it's literally a list of what you think are the priorities for your coverage over the short and medium term. 
And each item on it has a name and like a slug in newsroom terms and a short explanation for what it is, along with links to explainers for why that item is on the list. And it moves. So the priorities shift as events uh, overtake our predictions. Then on the other side, of, like maybe right next to it, you could start to count what you're actually devoting your news space to. And then you would have this constant comparison. These are the things that we want to emphasize, and these are the things that we're actually reporting. And instead of apologizing for that, you would simply say, well, that's the tension in a news business. Like you can't always do what you planned. You can't always do what you think is important. You have to react to what's going on in the world. And so it would be sort of a, a way to steer the tension between your agenda and what your performance is would be kind of like a running audit of your own coverage. You know, you're putting the unit there as the organization, right? Yeah, Vox, the newsroom. The New York Times, the Washington Post. A newsroom is a really newsroom. the unit. Yeah. Well, I think that may not – and I'm just thinking about this in real time here, but I'm not sure that's right. I, I think like running – having run a newsroom, I think it's too big. Um, I think anything that I could say about Vox or the Washington Post, more to the point, mm. there's so much happening Yeah. that – but I wonder if the unit here isn't the individual reporter. I wonder if the unit here – so I'm thinking here, my colleagues at Recode, they have in their bios a disclosure statement, every single yeah. one of them. That was in and my transparency post also. But there yes. you go. Yeah. And so it, it's not really the thing you're talking about, but it's a little bit like – here are some things you should know about them, right? Like, do they own some stocks? Are they married to somebody who's in the tech industry? It's, it's ways to know, you know, if there's something that might be biasing their reporting. Yeah. But you can imagine that going the other way, right? As like, instead of a disclosure statement, a mission statement, right? What is guiding your reporting? Yes. And yes. that would be, that might be a more manageable space from which to operate. Yeah, you can imagine it starting that way. Um, that is a recommendation I've made for years as well. And the, and the reason is that that's really the start of a very different system for trust, which is you know, a key word in this discussion. That is the alternative system to the view from nowhere because what those disclosure statements are is here's where I'm coming from. And here's where I'm coming from is a different way of generating trust because you know – where these reporters are coming from, you can factor that into their reporting and use whatever discount rate you want for their perspective. And this is another reason why I urge newsrooms to go public with their priority list is that it helps us say, here's where they're coming from. And, and that's a different way of generating trust from the view from nowhere. What the view from nowhere says is, look, we don't have a stake. We don't have a priority list. We don't have an ideology. We don't have a view of the world. We're just telling you the way it is. So believe it because that's the truth. And that w kind of claim is increasingly mistrusted. And if people on the receiving end don't trust that claim, you can't change that by insisting ever more strictly on that claim. And that's why I say here's where we're coming from is the alternative to the view from nowhere. The idea of truth there I think is interesting because this is a way in which Donald Trump has been very effective. I have this theory that Donald Trump turns everything he touches into something more like himself. He is amazing <laughs> at setting terms of the debate. He's amazing at setting models of behavior. He's amazing at – like the way he cuts a cleavage – it makes politics more like what he says it is. Mm -hmm. um, anything – like something as complicated as politics or the media or politicians or even a human being, it can be a lot of different things, right? Depending on how you treat me, for instance, or what context I'm in, like I'm grumpy in the mornings. I am nicer in the afternoon. Like there's like all kinds of things that can happen with, with a person and politics even more so. There are times when our politics can be very inspiring, when we can be unifying, when we can be trying to make things better. And there are times when our politics can be divisive. It can, go, it can fall into violence. I mean – and it's all the same country. Mm -hmm. And one thing Donald Trump does, I think, is 
he creates the thing he is in the world um, and and makes everybody else play in that game. He makes the media more like an opposition party by treating it more like one. I always think yeah. about his fake news awards where on Twitter all these journalists were like, oh, my God, my tux is in the dryers or it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's an honor just to be nominated. And for that moment, by treating us like the opposition, he got us to act a little bit more like the opposition out of frustration, right? And it wasn't a huge deal. But I always felt like that was a small victory for him because if you were on his side and you were looking at how we were acting, it kind of seemed like we were the thing he said we were, not fake, but the opposition to him, like we hated him. And one of the things there is Donald Trump has created this uh, rallying around the idea of truth, right? In a world of alternative facts, where he says, like, whereas people say, we had more people at our inauguration there before, and you're like looking at a picture. Mm -hmm. It's like you have to stand up for what's fundamentally a very simplified idea of truth. Mm -hmm. That like some things are wrong and some things are correct, which is true. But not to sound too postmodern here, but I do think one of the problems is that there are a lot of things that can be true simultaneously and some of them cut in different directions. And it's about like how you frame the question and it's about like the world is complicated. And and I do think one difficulty here is that he's gotten us just kind of like retreat to this idea of a very narrow idea of truth. Like we are defending the concept that just some things can be provably true. Right. When I think one of the very hard things, the, the harder question about the media, it's why I'm always more concerned about the problems of real news and the issue of fake news. It's like really easy to know what to do about fake news. You should get rid of it. But it's like the way Hillary Clinton's emails were covered. Oftentimes, and not always, that coverage was true, but it was so disproportionate to what was happening that I think it was actually false. It was yeah. it created a it created an equivalence that shouldn't have actually been there. And you could look at me and say I'm biased and I'm you know like I'm just a hack and maybe, but I also think that's correct. But we don't have a good way of talking about those problems of truth, like the hard problems of what is correct about the world, what is a way of looking at the world that makes sense versus just like what is narrowly true. And fact-checking feels to me like part of the problem here, actually. Mm-hmm. It does a lot of good, but it's so based on this idea that we can adjudicate, like, can it be fact-checked? And if it can, then it's true. And if it can't, then it can't. And the really good fact-checkers have much more complicated approaches to this. But I think we struggle a lot in this boundary of what are we talking about when we talk about true? Are we talking about like literally like it's not false? Or are we talking about our work is giving you an accurate perspective on the world in context? Yeah, I think we're completely losing this battle, <laughs> you know, on, on every level. And fighting about truth itself is – there's something inherently polarizing about that. And I think we're just at the beginning of understanding some of his methods for profiting in an environment where truth has become kind of exploded. Um, an example would be his use of verification in reverse. That's my term for it. Uh, you know, verification is trying to nail down a claim with uh, facts, evidence, data. Verification in reverse is taking something that's been nailed down and introducing doubt about it. When you do that, it releases a lot of energy, controversy, fear, or reaction. And then you can power your political movement with that energy. And I think this is one way that he has profited from from this sort of mess around – around truth that journalists are enmeshed in. And I, I, I don't think there's an easy way out of that, um, partly because the, the, the truth-telling system in political journalism actually rested on certain assumptions about how public actors would behave, especially presidents would behave. And um, Trump shatters all those assumptions. So f- a, a simple example would be Savvy political reporters took it for granted that all candidates would be risk averse. They didn't even have a category for the political candidate who was risk friendly. And that's what Trump is. He's not only risk friendly, he 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 risks everything every time he opens his mouth. And I and I think that so many of the routines of political journalism were based on assumptions behaviorist assumptions about how candidates would behave that simply do not apply. And that's that's one of the epistemological crises in journalism right now. Speaking of epistemological crises, something you've talked about that I think is pretty important is the way having an asymmetry between the parties fries the circuits of yeah. journalism. Do you just want to talk about that idea a bit? Yeah, I think over time political reporting started to rest on a, a picture of the 
political system that most journalists carried around in their heads and they shared that picture of how the political world works with their sources and with people inside the game, the people who um, staff the campaigns and serve as spokespeople and who are the political strategists and um, who are there in Iowa two years before the election and you can have drinks with them in the Marriott. And in that picture you ha of the political system, you have these two parties. They're, they're roughly equal in weight and they have different philosophies uh, about what's good for the country and there's a battle between those philosophies every uh, election and ground is lost and they're roughly equivalent and so as a political reporter, you, you can stand between them and develop sources on both sides uh, and tell the story of politics as a battle between these two uh, beasts and uh, they, are, they are roughly similar. And when one party, as Norm Ornstein and Tom Mann documented, starts to behave in a different way than the other one and begins to um, alter its constitution, all those routines start to crash. But the people who have made careers out of those routines and who have come to power in them, themselves in a way through them, they don't want to deal with that. And I think the asymmetry between the parties built up over time, since way before Trump came on the scene, and the press kind of like let it go. They knew it was happening, but it was too hard to redraw the entire system. So they they kind of kept fitting politics to a more a symmetrical picture as it became more and more asymmetrical. One of the ways to think about that, I think, goes back to your point about taking responsibility. That. One of the things we've often done as a way of like pinging the system and seeing if we're doing this right is doing it on a navigational principle, not a like a principles principle, which is to say to, to your point that if we were between the two parties. Yeah. Then you know you're doing it right. If both you, you hear this all the time in journalism, if both sides are angry, then you're doing something right. Yeah. As if like <laughs> as if the truth is always somehow antagonistic to everybody simultaneously. Yeah, let me give you a little perspective on that. In 1979, Herbert Gans, sociologist, published a really interesting book called Deciding What's News. And in that book, which is a study of how journalists make decisions, he points out that one of the factors that goes into decision-making in a newsroom is the simple truth that journalists have to present their work every day, whether it's ready or not. And they publish their mistakes constantly. And so they are, in the nature of their job, uniquely vulnerable to criticism. And because they are vulnerable to, to criticism, legitimate criticism, they need ways to ward that off. They need, they need ways to protect themselves against the critiques that they know are not only coming but are in many ways deserved. And so one of the ways they do that is by saying – hey, I'm not here for either side, or we are just balanced here, or what's your problem? We quoted your guys and we quoted the other guys. And so routines that offer protection become extremely important to them. Paul Taylor, who was a reporter for the Washington Post back in the 90s, you may remember him. He at one time was considered uh, David Broder's protege. He wrote something about this that was really insightful. He, he said, when I write my story and I look for the for the midpoint between the worst and the best that could be said about somebody, which is what you were talking about. He says, I'm seeking truth, yes, but I'm also seeking refuge. I think that's a really important insight is that lots of things that journalists do, they do not because they're strictly truth-telling. It's because they provide protection. I, I love that idea of routines that offer protection. I think that's a really important important concept here. One way I've been thinking about this, so I come up through blogging, I've always been a critic of the idea of objective reporting, the idea that reporting can be objective. And part of the reason I'm a critic of it is that it often seemed to me that what you were getting wasn't objectiveness, it was formalism. Mm -hmm. We had come yeah. up with objective reporting had come to mean a kind of formalism in how reporting is structured. It quoted both sides. It, it had a kind of like approach and it was protective. And one of the things that I think happened is that there was this approach to journalism 
that we used to hide. Journalists used it to hide. And then our enemies or our antagonists or the people who are angry at us, our critics, used it to manipulate us. Yeah. So if anything, that's a formalism. That's right? called anything, working the refs, right? Called working the refs, exactly. Yeah. And in some weird way, I believe they came to understand it better than we did. Yeah, because I think we, that's true. Because we had a kind of version of it we said and then a version of it we followed and then like a version of it that we could follow on deadline, right? Mm-hmm. There were like all these different things happening simultaneously. It's something that was fuzzily defined from the beginning. Yeah. But it was mostly a public shield. It, it was mostly like not a principles level view of, of how to, of, of what truth is, um, which is in, in theory what we're trying to get at. It was – like an idea of like how to do journalism, I don't want to say safely because a lot of that journalism is very dangerous, but it was a on the industry and institutional level, it was like a, a way to keep the maximum number of people connected to your institutions, um, which was the business model in a period of monopolies. Yeah. But we didn't really understand it as that because like nobody wants to think, and particularly in journalism, we never want to think about what we're doing as a business, which is another complicating factor here, which you don't get in other kinds of business. Well, let me build on that. Yeah, please. On this point that you that you made about protection, another form of protection is what I call the savvy style in political journalism. And I say that because the question, who's going to win, which is the classic horse race question, is a safe question because it's clearly not ideological. And one of the things that I think got the political press into so much trouble – is that some point in the late 70s, 80s, I think political journalism took a wrong turn into this kind of savvy style of analysis where you take that slack that uh, Felix said they had, that room for interpretive maneuver, and you use it to start chronicling the game aspect of politics and bringing readers inside both the strategies and the tactics of the political players in an attempt to explain who is winning and how they're winning. And that style of coverage, which is focused on political operatives and polling and positioning and, as I said, the game, is in a way protection itself because it's very easy to produce that coverage and seem totally non-ideological and not offend anyone. And one of the really insidious results of that style, which became the dominant style in Washington journalism, was that it teaches citizens to look at their fellow citizens as objects to be manipulated. And that way of seeing where you're teaching the readers to become kind of like insiders themselves was, I think, a big wrong turn. I want to think about that for a second because I – that doesn't ring true to me and, and, and in this way, but but I could be wrong, which is I agree first on that – on both that style existing and on how poisonous it is. But I think that was about peers. I think that was about climbing the journalistic ladder. I think this savvy style in journalism is about writing for other journalists and impressing your editors and impressing people who might give you a job and impressing the people who are your sources and, and sort of on and on and on down the line. And not to say that it has nothing to do with readers because some readers are into it, but many, many, many more are not. But like I'm a journalist and uh, um, I've been in lots of rooms with people who could give me a job or give me help or who are my peers and whose respect I want. And we're all political junkies, right? We're all doing this because on some level we're really interested in it. Mm -hmm. And the the coin of the realm – is the savvy style, is knowing what they don't know, is being able to make predictions that they can't make. Right. I I always think it's very interesting that these tip sheets that became very important, first um, the Mark Halperin, uh, the Note, and then Mike Allen's playbook, a lot of them have their genesis, if you like go and read the profiles of them, as something that was being done internally Internally, for other journalists, and then it got brought out to the world. Yeah. Right? It never started with the reader in mind. It always started with a peer group in mind. And then it became it became so influential about on the peer group that everybody else begins doing it too, and I always uh, thought like as yeah. a as a like a mythology of these, but also as a true um, origin story, it's a very different product when you sit down and ask what does the audience need versus what do my bosses need. 
Oh, totally. I, I, I agree 100 percent on that. Um, and before Halpern's tip sheet, there was a, a, even an earlier version in Newsweek called uh, the Conventional Wisdom Watch, uh, which Jonathan Alter right. would remember. Um, it was the same sort of, of thing. But uh, um, what or you're hotline. saying – yeah, hotline. Right, which was like you had Very to pay similar. a lot of money to subscribe to it. I mean, Chuck yep. Todd ran that and, and, and yeah. he's now running it. And it was for insiders. Yeah. I mean, it was very expensive. Yeah, but there's no contradiction between what you're saying and what I said. You're right about what the incentives for savvy coverage are. I was talking about what the message is for the people it's presented to. Because there's something very weird about telling citizens, voters, what the uh, candidates are doing to win the game. I mean, should I vote for the candidate with the best strategy? As you said, it's not a public-centered approach. It's a peer-centered approach. There's a reason that fully half of business travelers do not use their company's chosen travel management platform. Booking business travel and just getting where you need to go, it's it's completely outdated. It's time-consuming. It's costly. Trip Actions takes the pain out of corporate travel management with a complete solution that helps businesses save and keeps employees happy. Because it's the first travel management platform designed from the ground up with the road warrior in mind. It's got easy booking from an app or a desktop, 24-7 proactive support around the globe, and incentives for employees to save on travel expenses. Companies large and small see over 90% adoption and save up to 34% on travel spend when they use Trip Actions. That's why companies from Lyft to Sara Lee's Frozen Bakery trust Trip Actions with their business travel. And they reward travelers for saving company money. They reward you just for checking them out. Go to tripactions.com, slash EZRA, attend a 30-minute demo, you'll get a $100 Amazon gift card. But it is for this month only. Go to tripactions.com, slash EZRA, for a free demo and a $100 Amazon gift card. Hi, this is Aaron Patinkin, CEO of Ovenly. And I'm Natasha Case, CEO of Cool House. And, and together, together, we're, we're the, the co-hosts of Start, Start to, to Sale. Sale. We talk to entrepreneurs about what it takes to build a business from launch to exit. We'll really talk about the experience in the trenches, the most valuable lessons learned to get them out of there. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe to our show today. And thanks to Smartwater for being the founding sponsor of Start to Sale. I want to talk about the audience because I think something that we're doing here that is always something we do here that that is in a a lot of your work is that the actor being framed here is journalists. Mm -hmm. But increasingly and, and in a way that was not true I think 40 years ago, the audience is a really important actor. Yeah. Um, they're important in what people see, right? Like given how much of the distribution is social or search, whether or not people are liking the stories we do has a huge effect on which stories folks are seeing no matter what the total number of stories we're producing is. True. And we talk a lot about left-right polarization, but there's this like fundamental polarization of interested, uninterested. Most people don't want to follow political news closely because like why would you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and – the people who do, in the same way the people who follow sports news closely do, have a team. This has stakes. They care about who wins and who loses. And so they're coming in with their own desires. They're, they're actors in all this too. Yeah. Um, they're not just passive recipients. And, and in fact, like now in this world where a lot of what we want to write about is stuff people are already reading or talking about, there are assignment editors in a way that was much less true you know, a couple decades back. Oh, totally. And yeah. so I, I think there's something here about, you know, we can have all this discussion about like what we amplify and, and what we're doing, but a lot of what we're doing is what we think people want from us or what they're demonstrating they want on these like algorithmic platforms that are tuned to hype up the highest and most tribally intense emotions. And that seems like a part of this that we have a lot more trouble talking about because like who wants to blame the audience for anything? Like I don't. And oftentimes, I think we're the ones serving them poorly. But I I think we can't really get away from the fact that a lot of what's happening now is it's not even stuff we are deciding to do. It's stuff we are following our audience into doing. Yeah. Well, I think one of the key facts about journalism today is that the audience has a lot more power. The users have a lot more power than they used to. There's been a shift in power. Um, They have more power because they have more choices. Uh, They have more power because the internet is two-way. They have more power because journalists are exposed to public comment and ridicule and feedback in a way that they weren't before. 
They have more power because their choices, as you said just now, drive so much behavior in newsrooms. And they have more power because they're paying more of the freight in the case of um, subscription models and the era of the New York Times meter and the way in which um, reader revenue has become um, so important to, to newsrooms. And so when there's a shift in power, the relationship changes. When one party gets more power than the other, the relationship has to change. And I don't think journalism is really ready for that. I think this, this is one of the one of the real challenges that I think the New York Times is having right now is that the rising power of the Times core audience is creating anxiety among the journalists there because they sense that this rising power can end up uh, as a kind of censor. They don't want to produce news for a ideological segment, but those are the supporters of the Times. And they fear the rising power of the audience as much as they are relieved that more and more people are willing to support them with digital subscriptions. I think the the leadership required to navigate through this changed relationship where the users have a lot more power is just not there at that institution. I want to talk a little bit about how that power is expressed because I think this is this is something I'm struggling with. Let me give an example. Uh, there are a lot of ways somebody can tell you what they want, but the specific way journalists are learning what their audience wants is Chartbeat, yeah. um, is this Metrics. real-time analytics platform that we all have, um, Chartbeat or you know other competitors of it, or to some degree social analytics that we all have, where things are going out in the world and all of a sudden you see a lot of dots, mm-hmm. right? You write about someone like – uh, again, to go back, like say Michael Avenatti saying something really, really out there or really intense or saying like, I've got something that's going to bring bring all these people down. And maybe he does, right? But, you know, versus like you write about Amy Klobuchar's new proposal to, you know, improve infrastructure or whatever. And it's like the Avenatti one fills with dots and the Klobuchar one doesn't. Yeah, it's like a heat and map. One of the things I think about a lot is that on the one hand, that it, that is the way the audience is expressing power on us. I mean, we saw this very – I remember back in, in 2015 when we began writing about Bernie Sanders and all of a sudden we would see – like this is way before he began going up in the polls. We would see huge influxes of traffic from Reddit, yeah. right? And so compared to, say, Martin O'Malley, who would write about it, like nothing would happen, <laughs> um, you're like, OK, like there's a real audience interest in Bernie Sanders. Let's cover him more. Yeah. Right. And politicians who can get this right. Enthusiasm matters. Right. These are actually important. These are signals that matter. But but to go back to, to say, Avenatti or, or some of these other questions, the way the audience is expressing this, which is primarily, uh, again, coming from social platforms and, and things where they're also getting algorithmically enhanced or manipulated or amplified is – It's a weird way of expressing an opinion, right? It's not the same as what they would tell you if you sat down with them in a room for a couple hours. And there's a real question over which is the real them, right? Right. Is it what they are clicking on or what they tell you they want in a kind of calmer way? Is it, you know, do I really want like to eat Oreos? I mean, yes, I really want to eat Oreos. Or do I really want to eat healthy? Because I also do really want to eat healthy. Like these things are both true for me. And one of the things I worry about, I'm not upset about the audience getting more power, but I'm worried that – the way in which the very attenuated, narrow way in which we can hear them mm-hmm. and the way in which we can hear them is mediated by other platforms that like have their own very messed up incentives, which we've not talked about that much, mm-hmm. is creating a very bad relationship between us and them. A relationship – you know, I, I think one way to think about this is that in an era where the audience has more power, are they a lot happier with journalism? Yeah. Are they do they like us better? Yeah. And the answer is no. No. <laughs> so so something's going wrong here. Yeah. Well, we maybe we're getting somewhere, uh, Ezra, because I think what we may need is journalists who learn how to listen to both of those things. Meaning, as you know, I'm sure, because you've done so much work on it, healthcare is really important to people. That is something that they say again and again, and they often show it with their behavior. But it's not the immediate thing like listening to Michael Avenatti's latest explosive charges. And so maybe what journalists need to do is approach those two things, these sort of longer, deeper priorities that people say um, matter to them as one set of inputs and the immediate 
traffic numbers and what they're clicking on and what they're what they're talking about today as another set of inputs and steer with both because that's the kind of relationship that that journalists need with their users. It's very similar to a friend who can tell you the truth about yourself even if you're not necessarily open to hearing it. How does that ever happen? It does happen in in our lives. Well, if our friend understands us and is most of the time in sync with us, then maybe we're willing to hear difficult truths from that person. And I think the relationship between journalists and their users is very much like that. There has to be the sense that most of the time you're listening to me, you understand me, you have some sense of what my life is like, and you're responding to me with that knowledge. And then sometimes you're telling me things I don't want to necessarily hear. And that ability to say to somebody, you're not focused on this, but you should be. That's trust in in uh, in journalism. On the topic of getting somewhere, because it'd be great, it'd be great if we did, um, rather than me just depressing everybody for an hour and making everybody in my profession hate me. What are things that make you optimistic right now? What are what would you like to see organizations, including Say Mine, try? What could be? I don't want to say answers, but what what should we be trying? Well, this is a very difficult question you ask me because mostly I'm pessimistic. Mostly um, I think we're losing. But if I was forced to say, well, what is going right? One thing that's going right is I think there's a much broader recognition among part of the public that journalism is really important to them and that they have to support it for it to exist and that when other institutions aren't operating – Sometimes the free press is the last thing that you have. I think many more people recognize that now than did uh, before our current political crisis. And that is a good thing and you see the results in the support that uh, news organizations including yours, I I assume, have gotten since 2016. Another positive thing is that I I think over the long run and we're we're in the middle of it now, transparency methods creating trust – are winning over institutional authority by necessity or the view from nowhere by necessity. And as transparency becomes more and more the way to produce trust, I think people are going to start to become expert at it and they're going to learn what works in that in that space. And maybe we'll even have um, innovations like some of the ones we've been talking about here that that prove out. So I think that's a positive thing. And a third thing that's positive is the era of monopoly journalism when you had these big institutions and two newspapers in, in Los Angeles, as you described earlier, was an era when journalists were cogs in a system. They filled roles. And now they are allowed and encouraged more often to be people. And I think readers and users and voters have – more personal relationships with journalists. And I think that's a good thing uh, as well, even though it can go wrong and it can lead to disasters, it can lead to attacks, and um, there's all sorts of downsides to it. But the emergence of the journalist as an individual with a voice who is responsible for what they do is a positive thing as well. And then young people still want to be journalists. There's still an attraction to a life in which truth-telling is central to your responsibilities, and that's a positive thing. One of the things you you bring up there that uh, I actually do want to make sure we cover is I think one of the very central tensions in journalism right now for any individual institution is are we for everyone or not? And if we are, but we find we can't be, what does that mean? And the way I mean it is this. You talked about – because I do think this is one of the, the truly positive trends right now. The outpouring of support for a lot of journalistic organizations as they have begun to be seen as a bulwark of freedom in the face of a country that has at the very least a leader with more autocratic intuitions. Yeah, it's only part of the public, of course. Right. That's what you're going to say. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. the, the flip of the explosion of support for journalists as Trump has targeted us and as um, we have in turn or maybe even not in turn, just as doing our job, as Marty Barron says, done tremendous investigative reporting and called out things that are untrue and 
acted as a space in which like he couldn't just dominate the agenda also comes with the let's say 40-ish percent of the country that is like pretty deeply on his side Mm -hmm. turning on us in a way that I haven't seen before. Right, yes. that has always been there. Right, there's long been a right wing war on the press, but but this is explosive in a way it hasn't been before. Yeah, and it creates space for new outlets and new. You know, I mean, it, it, it's a fracturing. And so, on the one hand, we become more important to the people who feel like they are on our side, and we have become like less important to, to the ones who aren't. We play a more important role for like <laughs> I don't know even how to describe it. Like the people who like journalism, but I do think the tension in that is. I think a lot of people in journalism want to return to a time. To some degree, I want to feel like I am in a time where what we do is for everyone, right? Yeah. We we are creating a common set of facts upon which we can build a political system, a social ecosystem, a country, a world. And on the other hand, it may not be possible that part of that is up to the audience, not to us. And yeah. I, I'm curious how you just think about that tension because in some ways the exact thing that is increasing the feeling that journalists are, are are on our side is the thing that is repelling that people feel journalists are not on their side that they're on the other side yeah and like that's like that's, that's what that's where the view from nowhere came from in some ways right like one way you, you're just not as good at everything but you're more acceptable to everybody your oatmeal totally but if you're not like you're much more valuable in some ways to some people but much more repulsive to others. Yeah, what you're describing, I think, is at the moment a problem without a solution because it's it's actually worse than what you said. Oh, good. I was worried my presentation was too optimistic. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Right. Um, There's a core, I I think it's about 30 percent of Trump supporters who uh, at this point disbelieve – the Voxes and Washington Post and New York Times of the world on principle because they've been instructed to do that and because there's been a culture brewing uh, in the conservative movement for a long time that encouraged that and now it has a very efficient system. The loudest voice in the culture, the president at the top, is constantly giving that message. An army of online activists and trolls at the bottom of the pyramid – Uh, shouts down news stories they don't like, attacks individual journalists, ridicules the uh, institution. And then between those two, you have the mediators, Rush Limbaugh, Drudge, Fox News, Daily Caller, that efficiently connect the top and and the bottom. That's a very strong system. And the result of that is that for about 30 percent of the electorate, Trump is the major source of news about Trump. Which means that for that portion of the American public, an authoritarian news system is already up and running. Another way to put it would be before journalists log on in the morning, about a third of their public is already gone. And when they do their job, when they hold power to account, when they uncover new facts, when they behave as a fourth estate, that dynamic is actually reinforced because Trump attacks them and the, and the news that they're digging up about him enrages his supporters and it confirms their belief that this institution is against them. And so by doing their job, they actually make that s- situation worse. And right now, nobody has any idea what to do about that. And I spent the summer in Germany and I was much more attuned to European politics And you can start to see that same pattern in the rise of all the right-wing populist movements in Europe. Well, that's a cheerful place to to begin to close out. Um, So let me ask you the question we used on the podcast, which is, what are three books you've read, um, you know, related to to the topics we're talking about that that you would recommend to, to the audience? Well, one of them is one I mentioned, Deciding What's News by Herbert Gans in 1979. And it's a really good look at how journalists make decisions. Uh, And I've relied on it ever since I read it when I was in graduate school in the early 1980s. A second would be the classic Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America, which is where I recommend anybody who wants to make a serious study of American culture and politics begin. I think it's the first book you should read because it looks at democracy in America as a culture, not a political system, but a culture. And it's sort of the Ur text or the original text for that view. Another one is a little book 
well, not many people know it, published in 1970, called Exit, Voice, and Loyalty by A.O. Hirschman, who's an economist. And it's a small book that tries to explain the options people have when they're dissatisfied with a company or an institution. Exit means you just leave. That's, that's the market's most efficient way of registering dissatisfaction. Exit means you just stop buying the product. Loyalty is different. It's what can I do? I'm a Cubs fan and I suffer even though I feel the team is mismanaged and maybe one day it'll be better. But I'm a Cubs fan and so I'm loyal. And voice is you speak up. You say, hey, United Airlines, you know, you're mistreating your customers. And the interaction between exit voice and loyalty is an analytical tool that I've used throughout my career, and I, and I highly recommend it. If there's one more, it would be Making Democracy Work by Robert Putman. And it's a study of different civic traditions in southern and northern Italy. And it's one of the most profound books about the connection between democracy and trust that I've read, even though it's now more than 25 years old. So those would be some of them. Those are great recommendations. Jay Rosen, this is a tricky conversation for me to have, and I really appreciate you being here to think through it with me. Likewise. Thank you, Ezra. Thank you to Jay Rosen for being on the podcast. I found that conversation really helpful. Um, you can email me at EzraKleinShowBox.com. I wanted to add a couple of books to what he offered here. I mentioned one of them during this discussion. It was On Press by Matthew Pressman. It's not out yet, but it's really terrific. And you can pre-order it on Amazon, wherever you do pre-ordering of books. The other one is Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death. You might have heard of this book. It was a classic. It was released, I think, in the 80s. I read it recently for the first time, and it has been incredibly helpful in trying to understand what it is we're going through. I mean, the world that he predicted and was worried about and was thinking about, a world in which news moves through mediums that are more entertainment-oriented, and so news becomes entertainment, and so entertainment becomes news, and the whole thing begins to look more like the medium in which it is delivered. We are living through a version of that that is beyond what he could have imagined. But seeing the way he thought about it and talked about it, it's really clarifying. And then trying to apply it, he's talking about television, but trying to apply it to cable news and Twitter and Facebook and everything else, it'll make you look at it in a different way. So again, thank you to, to Jay. Thank you to my producer, Jill Meinberger, my engineer, Griffin Tanner. The Ezra Klein Show is a Vox Media podcast production, and we'll be back on Monday. And now a preview of a new show from our friends at Recode. Hey, Ezra Klein Show listeners. I just had dinner with them last night. This is Kara Swisher, editor-at-large of Recode. And I'm Scott Galloway. I teach marketing at NYU Stern School of Business. And we're here to tell you about our new podcast together called Pivot, where we unleash our hot takes, provocations, and predictions about tech and business. We'll also talk about who's screwing up. Spoiler alert, that's a lot of people. So therefore, we obviously talked about Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook and some others. Subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to the show.